Hello, everyone. My name is Ian Adams. I'm an MSc student at the University of Saskatchewan studying under Dr. Elwood and being co-supervised by Dr. Henry here at the U of A. Uh, today, I'll provide an update on the CN Mile 184.4 landslide located in the river subdivision of the Assiniboine River Valley. Um, so kind of, if you're not uh, familiar with where the Assiniboine River Valley is, it's located near the Saskatchewan-Manitoba border, uh, or with our site being located northwest of Minneota. Uh, so one of the kind of triggering effects and things we've learned from previous studies in the area is that heavy rainfall effects do greatly impact the regional stability as the entire river valley is filled with lots of uh, slow moving landslides um, occurring throughout. So today what I was going to talk about is kind of some of the site work side of things and some of the data we've been collecting on site and then providing some just kind of updates on our current research and progress. Um, so for site work, so far what we've done, um, kind of things kicked off back in summer 2019 when we kind of had our initial um, uh, field work completed. So that's when we had two boreholes drilled, installed some piezometers with also the ability to take some slope inclinometer readings, um, installed some survey pins, and then also extracted some core samples from borehole one. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, as with many projects and many things in life, uh, there was the delay from spring 2020 to fall 2021. But back in October of 2021, we we're able to get back out there and kind of do some more site reconnaissance kind of for a big field trip in the following May. So in that trip, we installed a weather station and some geocube units, which I'll be talking about a little bit more as I go on. Uh, then we also did install some data loggers for the piezometers um, and then just some site um, data collection. And then the last trip there is in October. We just did some site adjustments for the weather station and geocubes. Um, but as I mentioned, things we'll talk about um, moving forward. So. This is just a really nice photo um, or some nice photos that really just show the features of the site. So you can see in figure A, um, we do have a well-defined toe at the slope with the landslide laterally, laterally being 150 meters. Um, a neat site feature is that the toe does continue and connects with the neighboring landslide at 184.3. So there is some interaction between the two landslides, but our research focus is 184.4. Um, well, it is a little difficult to show just with the two photos, but B and C is just trying to highlight the headscarp located just upslope of the railway track. So it is continuing to regress. So it's something that we will continue to monitor and kind of with our instrumentation. So uh, the first four uh, kind of already just touched about when talking about the field work, but the last one here for the INSAR data, um, that's included just for completeness, but that's something so Rab will be discussing a little bit later. So for our site, um, we have the weather station just located west of the landslide um, with then our geocubes placed sporadically throughout just, just to monitor some key features. And I'll kind of go through each one here and provide a quick little update on the information we have. So starting off with the slope inclinometers, um, more recently, we've seen a steady increase in slope movements. So kind of since May, the May 7th reading there in 2021, we have seen a big increase movements relative to the past. Now, there is some preliminary correlation with um, the past kind of year, year and a half being a lot more wet than what it previously has been. But I'll talk about that when I um, share some of the data. So with that, um, moving on to the piezometers. Uh, so this is kind of the previous um, information leading up to the installation of the data loggers. So kind of going in, we knew that the piezometric levels were relatively constant on the site once everything's kind of equalized. And with everything installed, that's exactly the trend we're seeing here, just with a little more clarity. Um, and insight, we do see a little more fluctuations with over the summer changing about 0.8 meters, roughly around there. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see moving forward, you know, in a, a more dry year, in a wetter year, and also just during spring thaws, how these levels might be changed and influenced. Now, kind of taking a little bit of a side from the data collection and site stuff. Um, up to this point with our site investigations, our borehole collection, and then the SI and piezometer readings, we have been able to produce a model kind of representing um, the expected conditions on the site. So the model shown here in figure 12 is from Daxon, uh, one of Dr. Hendry's previous students. Um, so getting a good idea of having a base model that we can continue to improve with some more characterization and knowledge as we gain it. Um, with that, jumping back to the data collection side of things. So in that May 2022 trip, as I mentioned, I will be, we did install some geocubes. Now, I'll leave the in-depth explanation to Ingrid. Uh, she'll probably do a much better job than me anyway. Uh, but just simply, um, there's kind of three main nomenclatures to talk about. So there's the mobile geocubes or just geocubes. So you're placing those where you want to monitor, uh, which then they use satellites to send their location to a fixed geocube that then any relative displacement between the fixed geocube and the mobile geocube itself is the registered displacement. 
And then all that information is then sent to the GeoPort, which is then um, submitted online with um, access. So for a specific site, uh, we did install eight units with the idea of just kind of looking at a few key features. So kind of looking at figure 14A, kind of working left to right there. So we place one just downslope of the weather station on the nearby hill or uh, valley, just to see if we can see any movements there and compare it to the movements we're seeing out 184.4. Then we did install two kind of near the posometers near the SI readings so we can have comparable data. We installed two in the headscarp, one within the headscarp itself, and one right above it. So we'll see if we can monitor the regression. One slightly east, just to see if we can um, characterize any movements we're seeing in the electrical poles nearby. Then we also had one installed on mile 184.3. So any information we've been able to deduce from 184.4, we can hopefully relate to the nearby landslide. So unfortunately, though, we have had some issues with some cellular reception for data collection. Um, just very preliminary from September and October here. We do see some movements that are reasonably agreeable with the slope inclinometers, but just off of the two-month data set, it simply isn't enough to make any firm conclusions from that. Now, the Geoport unit itself, the one that transmits the data, we did try relocating that in October of 2022 with um, not much success. We're currently looking at some solutions to get that fixed, whether that be trying to adjust the antenna, if possible, um, maybe exploring the use of Starlink or something similar to have local internet available, but that's something we're gonna be working on kind of in our next site trips here. So for the last uh, piece of instrument here, we have the weather station. So this was, I installed this uh, back in May as well. So the four kind of main uh, instruments we have installed is the first one being the atmosphere gauge. So reading things like temperature, barometric pressure, relative humidity, items like that. Uh, the next one being the snow gauge using the distance between the gauge itself and the ground to estimate snow depth during the winter, then also the wind gauge and rain bucket. So I just want to share these two plots because I feel like they just provide a good summary of kind of the success we've had so far with collecting data. So in the temperature data set shown above, um, the two points I just want to talk about is at kind of in that July. So on the left side of the plot to the left, um, we did lose cellular reception shortly with the weather station um, for about a week there. But Thankfully, everything is stored offline and logged remotely on the unit itself. So once we got reception back, we're able to access that data so there isn't a gap in the uh, information itself. The next drop there in October, so right before actually our site trip, the atmosphere gauge itself did seem to lock up. Um, but once we sang it, it seemed to be working in order. Um, and the one nice thing is the snow depth gauge does have an independent temperature sensor. So even with that being down, we do still have information we can fill in that gap there. So if that does happen again, we'll just be replacing the unit simply. Um, supplier will send us one, so that's all good. The next one being the precipitation rate, and this is kind of highlighting that idea of what the triggering effects for the landslide are. So this is kind of what it looked like over the summer with a lot more rainfall um, occurring right after the installation with a few peaks here. Um, so kind of taking this and transitioning this into our kind of current research, and that's kind of looking at the impacts of potential climate change and weather variability. So being able to take this data and continue to improve it um, and then filter it and process it with some of the work SORAB's completed recently, um, all of the goal of kind of being able to get a better idea of see if we can have a better understanding of what triggering effects are, whether that be if it's a single heavy rainfall event or if it's simply more of accumulation over a longer time period, and being able to relate that with the um, local data because one of the, our knowledge gaps is the closest weather station to the site is 30 kilometers away. So being able to take our information here related to that and see if we can look at trends in the past and then also look at trends in the future makes some sort of correlation in that manner. Now, shifting a bit of focus um, from the research, part of the work I've been working on more recently at the U of S here, um, starting off is with our core characterization. So similarly to Lamel's work in the Thompson River Valley previously, I'll be doing an in-depth characterization of the cores recovered. So including things such as water contents, our soil classification, Adberg limits, uh, looking at our consolidation and swell parameters with odometer tests. And then something I've kind of noted is there is a bit of a gap in the soil water characteristics side of things. So taking a crack at that. And if anyone's ever done a Tempe cell, you can understand some of the uh, fun problems you can have with that. But um, Thankfully, uh, due to some previous studies in the area, we do have an idea of what we're expecting. So we expecting a medium to high plasticity clay shale, um, you know, with differences between the weathered shale and the unweathered shale, you know, the weathered shale having a slightly higher water content, less plastic, and then the unweathered shale being um, a lower water content and more plastic. So with that information, uh, we'll be continuing that kind of in the next couple of weeks here and hopefully getting full swing in motion. Um, but one really beneficial thing that we did do when we extracted the cores initially was we did perform some x-ray imagery on them. So 
the big major benefit from this is being able to make a lot of guesses about what's in the core casing without doing any removing um, of the casing itself. So information such as seeing stratigraphic layering or soil variation, so maybe zones that it is maybe more weak or more strong, uh, looking at fractures, being able to identify both mechanical and potentially zones that may have been previously sheared, then also kind of the first three working together and then the density, uh, you know, seeing the variation with plot. And while there is some noise in the density data itself, it is really good at picking up any big discontinuities, um, so increases or decreases. So with that first three, it's really beneficial, especially since I wasn't there during drilling, um, just having an idea what's in the core. So when I'm going through, I can, you know, focus on areas that there may be a different in soil type or just maybe fractures, but still just being able to kind of have that caution and know about an issue. Um, so I can properly characterize and take necessary foes and inf take information as needed. So as you can see, kind of figure 21, it's a really good example. So you can see, um, you know, shades of light and dark and just knowing areas, whether it just be fractures or anything. Um, and then another good thing is for the shear strength testing I'll be completing, it will also give me a reasonable idea of where possible good quality intact samples are. So you can kind of see in the middle to the right of the Sample there, it seems a relatively consistent samples, which suggests that might be a good piece of core to be looking at. And with all this, we've um, another big benefit here is we have been able to preliminarily identify where our slip surface in the landslide occurs just from the imagery and comparing it with the SI data. So looking at where the disturbed zones are, so knowing especially around here to slow down um, and to take lots of notes here. So um, the last piece of kind of current research um, is then the shear strength testing I mentioned. So right now we're proposing to do three tests, um, the first two being the direct simple shear and direct shear. So we'll be doing kind of mirrored tests with them and compare the results with that. And the direct simple shear being a relatively new piece of equipment at the University of Saskatchewan that I've had the contextual fun of, you know, help setting up and fine tuning it. So that's going to be exciting to get to apply that here. Um, and then with that, kind of determining our strength parameters, our phi and C, and then also looking at our shear modulus as well. Um, we did with the DSS get the bender element attachment. So it's um, in simple being able to just send electrical current through a sample and get a shear modulus without any actual testing on it. So it's gonna be interesting to compare those results with the actual testing itself um, moving forward here. Uh, the last test is once the ring shear apparatus becomes available in the laboratory, I'll be looking at the residual friction angle um, of the shales as well, and then also doing some work on looking at displacement rates and seeing their influence as a higher displacement rate. We're expecting an increase in strength and see if we can explore that trend um, with some solid data. So that's kind of everything in motion right now. So I'm expecting here in kind of the next month, a couple of weeks here, everything's going to be picking up pace and hopefully getting lots of numbers soon. So. Uh, that's kind of everything I had to talk about today. So here are my references I used. Um, and I just want to thank you all for listening. You have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I have a question, if, if possible. Yep. Uh, this is David Wood. I'm in Sudbury. Um, when I looked at the first section that you had there, Ian, you yep. sort of have a, a cross section through the slope, and it appears that there's a significant amount of a significant greater thickness of the weathered clay shales right underneath the track here. Um, that interpretation you've got, where, you, where you've got a minimal amount of uh, the weathered shale upslope mm -hmm. of the, the you know the, the study area here, um, mm -hmm. do you have good evidence for that, or is this because this seems to be a very strange. Um, sort of section with a, a huge amount of this weathered shale right underneath the worst part of the area. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so I guess for specifically for our site, we are limited to two boreholes uh, relatively close down slope to the tracks. So specifically to our site, that's all the information we have. But we do have neighboring boreholes from 184.3 in a similar location, then also kind of looking at previous work in the area, um, that being from Melissa's site at 183.6. Um, and then just some previous work in the area. So it is based off assumptions and kind of looking at that, but we um, don't have any site specific um, borehole logs for that. Okay, so do you imagine that this this uh, pale green weathered shale is being um, is playing a part of this? Because obviously from the section here, it seems that the failure is above that area. Yeah, because in the pure formation, there is that kind of soft zone that it seems to be slipping on. So yeah, that is expected where a lot of the movements will be occurring. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Are you like correlating track geometry at all with any of the other 
but uh, that's outside the scope of my specific research, oh. but I think we were talking about. Yeah, we did have the discussion yesterday now that uh, CN is collecting your data really, really frequently, uh, weekly. Yeah. Um, so, so I think the, uh, that was, uh, they come up in our meeting tomorrow. The ability to monitor that more closely. Uh, we did have a project previously that did that for the Ripley landslide. It was successful, but the data was five times a year as opposed to 50 to 60 times a year. So okay. hopefully the increased frequency will show better results. Thank you.